Welcome back to uh, this uh, lecture video on uh, wastewater treatment processes. We're going to go uh, more in depth with uh, how the wastewater treatment plant is functioning and how you can dimension and design the different parts of the treatment process. So I assume that you have seen the, the virtual tour of Herning wastewater treatment plant and the introduction to the different processes that I went through there. So in this uh, video here, we will take a look at different parts um, of the plant. We will look at uh, the purification. So what is it that we want to deal with? Uh, what's in the wastewater that we need to treat before we can safely discharge the water to the receiving water body? Um, we're going to look a little bit about uh, yeah, what, what different substances we've got and what kind of outlet uh, requirements that are uh, reasonable to uh, to enforce in a given situation. Uh, and also I'll give you an example of how to calculate the volume of uh, one of the key tanks in the treatment plant, the so-called process tank, the bioreactor. And also we'll look at some various other aspects of uh, the entire treatment process. Uh, also uh, sludge production, which is one of the waste components that is generated uh, when we treat wastewater. But first, let's look at why do we need to purify water? You probably have a good idea of this yourself. Uh, what is in the sewage that we need to deal with before we can safely get rid of that water and, and uh, discharge it into our nice aquatic environment? So first of all, what we've got in wastewater is uh, organic matter. Organic matter constitutes a potential problem to the receiving water uh, because it will lead to an oxygen usage and potentially total removal of oxygen in the receiving water if we have too high a load of organic matter. This is also why we have the measurements of organic matter, the BOD and the COD are so-called biological oxygen demand measurement of the potential oxygen usage of the organic matter in the wastewater. So we basically actually uh, measure how many grams of oxygen per cubic meter of wastewater discharged will be used in the receiving water if this is not treated. COD is a similar, uh, slightly quicker measurement that, that measures more of the organic matter, but uh, also characterizes the organic matter, not just in gram of matter, but in uh, relation to how much oxygen it potentially consumes in the receiving water. Then of course we've got nutrients. So we have primarily nitrogen and phosphorus as the two key nutrients in the wastewater. And so why is this a problem? Well, the thing is that nutrients uh, may cause uh, stimulate growth of plants and algae and that sounds nice but if we get too much plants and algae in the environment, the waters will turn totally green and sunlight will not be able to penetrate to the bottom due to the shading out of the sunlight by the algae in the upper part of the water phase. That will result in a lack of growth of plants at the bottom, let's say in a lake, and hence we don't uh, actually stabilize the sediments with all of the materials that are found in a lake sediment or in a stream sediment that could potentially worsen the situation. Furthermore, when these algae die, and they eventually will, well, they will, they will uh, be con composed of organic matter, uh, and this organic matter will lead to further secondary oxygen depletion. So eutrophication is, is a long-term process. It's not an acute thing, it takes months uh, to occur, but over the year, it will lead also to lack of oxygen in our receiving water. And oxygen is so vital for all our aquatic life, both fish and insects and plants needs oxygen. Yes, also plants, they actually respire during nighttime. Now, we also have microbes in the water uh, that potentially can cause diseases. And of course, this is a very important element to uh, be aware of, especially if the water ends up in an uh, aquatic environment that is a potential resource 
for drinking water, which is the case in many places around the world. So we have a risk of spreading diseases like cholera or um, yes, many, many diseases uh, that, that uh, could be uh, spread with the water uh, if we do not uh, take care. Also, if even if we're not using the water for drinking water, well, it could be used for swimming or other recreational purposes. And, and there is also a risk of, of getting sick. So that is, and historically, probably the oldest reason to care about the wastewater. Finally, we have a lot of other chemicals uh, in wastewater. It could be pharmaceuticals, it could be also heavy metals, and a lot of different substances that come from industry or even from our households uh, and that potentially are toxic to plant and fish and insects in our environment. And of course, it could also be toxic to, to humans. So there is also an issue to, uh, to, wear, to uh, think about here. So this is uh, why we need to deal with the wastewater. If we, uh, yeah, just added also that, of course, there are some aesthetic elements as well, uh, smell and foul stuff that, that, that looks bad in, in the environment. That's, of course, also a, a concern. Now, uh, this wastewater, what we have got in it is then these different components, organic matter, BOD, suspended solids, also organic particles, inorganic particles. We've got the nutrient, we have various chemicals, but this little diagram here is to show that it is very different from one place to another, how much we actually find in wastewater. So just as, uh, as an example here, uh, we can see that, for instance, in Denmark, we typically uh, produce about 20 to 25 kilograms of organic matter measured as BOD per person per year, whereas uh, in India, that is uh, apparently in Egypt much smaller. Uh, they are not discharging the same amount of, of wastewater from, for instance, households as we are in Denmark. But if you go to, say, the United States here, you see that the numbers are considerably higher and uh, why is that? Well, that is typically because in America, it's very popular with uh, um, shredders or uh, pumps with, with uh, knives in the kitchen sinks that will cut down various organic waste and uh, transport this with a sewer system to the treatment plant instead of uh, taking this part out in the solid waste handling. Now, you can also see some other example of differences. For instance, in Denmark, we are typically discharging 1.5 to 2 kilograms of phosphorus for every person a year. Whereas if you go to Sweden, which is normally a country that is very similar to Denmark, they are down to approximately half of that level. So why is that? Well, one of the explanations to this is that we have quite hot water in Denmark with a lot of calcium and manganese in our waters. Uh, the drinking water, and when we do our washing, we need detergents to tie up this hardness in the water uh, in order for the laundry not to look gray and dull. Whereas in Sweden, they are using a lot of surface water and very soft waters, and they don't need the same amount of phosphorus for detergents uh, there. So there's a lot of interesting differences from country to country, and sometimes also from region to region. So it's very important to to look carefully into what we've got in the wastewater before we start designing our treatment plant. Another thing to be uh, looking into is what kind of sewer system we've got. We have looked into that previous in, in lectures, lectures before. Uh, and, and the main difference here is whether we have separate sewers or whether we have combined sewers, including stormwater, because from a combined sewer system, first of all, we've got some overflow structures to, to minimize the peak hydraulic load at the treatment plant. But in any case, there's going to be a considerably higher difference, a bigger difference from dry weather flow to, to peak flow in a combined uh, sewage area. So that is an important issue. Now, what's also important to think about when we are going to look for the design of a treatment plant is what kind of water that we are expecting to discharge the treated sewage into. Because there's a lot about how much dilution could we expect? Is it a 
bay or even an ocean with a large quantity of pollution, then maybe we don't need to treat the water as good. How robust is this receiving water? Meaning, what is the carrying capacity? What, what can it deal with of pollution? And maybe even a bit of pollution could be beneficial. You could say some nutrients could be a, a good thing, but how much can it take? So what are the potential effects, both in terms of, of quality, but also sometimes uh, the amount of water uh, where actually sometimes a, a contribution with extra well-treated wastewater can be a positive effect of the uh, environment. So, so we actually need to start here to look at this and that is what's going to set our requirements for the treatment process. So we're both going to look at what's in the wastewater and how much can we be allowed to discharge. Discharge requirements are uh, typically uh, made by local authorities with respect to general uh, legal requirements, national or uh, supranational requirements. Here I'm showing you the requirements from the European Union. Um, the uh, older wastewater treatment directive is currently under revision and uh, there's a uh, an attempt to, to tighten up a lot the requirements, general requirements for removing of nutrients in the European Union uh, that will probably come into force uh, <clears throat> this year or next year. So typically we have some requirements for the concentration of variant substances, but again, depending on what kind of situation we've got in receiving water, and also what kind of substances we're talking about, then typically nutrients, they have a long-term effect in the environment. Hence, the requirements for, for nutrients are typically average numbers. It doesn't matter that we in periods have a higher concentration if we in other periods can get a lower concentration. It is the amount of, of substance that get into the environment in a long run that really uh, is uh, decisive here. Other substances, such as, for instance, the organic matter uh, and, and other components, has a short-term effect. Too much organic matter will remove the oxygen in the water. And if that just happens uh, once or twice a year, well, that will be uh, devastating for the environment. It takes a long time to recover from this. So setting requirements for such uh, acute effect substances must be controlled in a different way which is typically a, a 90 percentile uh, requirement so that, that we have to be below the requirement in 90% of the time. Now let's take a look at uh, typical plant elements in a wastewater treatment plant and just review from, from what we went over in at looking at herning wastewater treatment plant. So uh, what we've got here, is um, a principal drawing of a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and uh, what you can see here is that we've got uh, an inlet, the water arriving over here. The first element is typically pumps. And then we have what we call the mechanical treatment, which is typically a screen and grit and grease removal. Uh, the next element is something that you may have uh, it's, it's not always, but it is a sedimentation tank or a primary clarifier, so-called, that will remove some of the organic matter in the form of the particles that can settle here. And if we do remove such elements, well, we need to treat such primary sludge, typically in a biogas plant, uh, before we can uh, dispose of it. Then we have the core and the heart of the process here, which is the so-called activated sludge process tanks. And we'll look more into what's going on in here, where the wastewater is mixed with this soup of activated sludge. Finally, we need to separate this activated sludge from the water, again by sedimentation, before the purified wastewater can be discharged, possibly after extra aeration and into the receiving water. So the... Uh, thing here is is very much this activated sludge uh, which is our workers at the plant so how much of that do we need and which conditions do we need to provide in order for these microbes in the activated sludge to do the job that we want let's take a look at the different elements of a wastewater treatment plant 
as mentioned, we have the mechanical treatment. Basically, here you see a cross-section of a circular clarifier. So the wastewater comes in with particles into a zone where the turbulence is taken out of the water. And then it slowly flows toward an overflow rim uh, at the perimeter of the tank, where it overflows into a, um, a trough and, and runs out of the uh, out of the system you can say typically there is a scraper arrangement where a very slow rotating sl scraper helps move the particles to the center from where they are pumped away uh, now such clarifiers they can be circular they can be rectangular but we typically divide them into two there was the primary clarifier which is located before the uh, biological process tank or we're talking about secondary clarifiers that are uh, an integrated part of the biological treatment system because they remove the biosolids and allow us to return the sludge and mix that with new incoming wastewater to maintain a stable concentration of sludge in our process tanks. Such uh, mechanical treatment can be combined with chemicals, as we say. So one typical chemical treatment element in wastewater treatment is to add some metal salts. It could be iron, it could be aluminum. These metal salts will react with dissolved phosphorus um, in the water and form a solid, a phosphorus iron, for instance, precipitate that will be an integrated part of the sludge. And as such, we can separate it out from the water. And when we take uh, a little of our sludge out every day from the plant, so-called excess sludge, we remove phosphorus from the plant in this way. So the basic elements here is to actually find out how much iron we need to dose, uh, and then we need to have uh, sufficient facilities to, to make sure that we actually also get the separation of the formed particles from the purified water. That brings us back to the heart of the biological uh, process, the bioreactors. We have this activated sludge uh, in the system uh, that is a very complex uh, mixture of all kinds of microorganisms. They adapt to the actual wastewater. So the type of microbes that can thrive in here and can grow and use the organic matter and other substances and break it down, what comes in wastewater, they are the ones who, who are going to dominate here. Also, the sedimentation tank is a selective process because some microbes will work or exist as single cells and they won't easily settle. And those microbes will be lost with the uh, purified wastewater. Whereas the type of microbes that are able to form flocks that are settleable, well, they will have another go and become the breeding stock of the activated sludge in the system. We also see here that we have something called excess sludge. So because of the growth of the biomass, which is fed every day with incoming wastewater and potentially also formation of chemical sludge due to addition of iron or aluminum salts, we need to remove sludge every day to maintain a stable concentration in the system. So every day we take out a part of the sludge, uh, and this is the so-called excess sludge. Now here's a microscopic picture of activated sludge where we can see nice flux, dense flux that are uh, settleable. And this picture shows uh, a, a, a portion of activated sludge taken from a process tank and left to settle for, for 20 or 30 minutes. And you can see a clear separation of, of the particles and the water. So this is actually what happens in the clarifier. Now the sludge is growing, as I said, and we are talking about a yield. So how much do they actually grow per kilogram of food that they are provided? So just like uh, other animals, if you feed a chicken, well, they might have a yield of uh, 100 gram of chicken per 100, one kilogram of food. But, but in this case, we are, we are considerably higher the way that we typically measure the yield here. But, but from, from a lot of uh, heuristics, from, from measurements at different plant, we know something about this, this yield constant. And this allows us to calculate how much sludge we'll produce at a plant if we know something about how much wastewater we're introducing to the system. 
Now, the key processes in the bioreactor are uh, breaking down of organic matter with oxygen. So the microbes are able to eat and decompose organic matter, uh, use some of it for growth, and also produce CO2 and water, uh, so break it down if provided with oxygen. Furthermore, uh, some uh, microbes, some special microbes, so-called uh, autotrophic uh, microbes, they, they uh, are able to decompose ammonia, which is uh, found in the raw wastewater. Most of our nitrogen is in the form of proteins that can be broken down to ammonia or are actually found as ammonia in the, in the raw wastewater. Now, these special microbes, they can also use oxygen and turn the ammonia into nitrate. And this is important because if we leave the wastewater with nitrate and organic matter, uh, the typical microbes that can break down organic matter, they can switch from oxygen to nitrate, many of them, and they can now do what's called the denitrification, turn the nitrate nitrogen into atmospheric nitrogen that can be degassed off to the atmosphere. So combining these two processes allows us to reduce the amount of nitrogen uh, in the water. We'll return to that later. But first, let's, let's take a little bit of a look at the key process of removing organic matter. Because if we look at heuristics, we can uh, look at so-called sludge loading or feed to microorganism ratio. So this is about how much organic matter kilogram BUD per day do we put into a system with a certain mass of sludge, a kilogram of volatile suspended solids, uh, which is a way to measure the mass of sludge. So if we look at this feeding ratio, uh, you could say the, the further down we go here, the more microbes we have for the same amount of food, the lower we feed them, the more we starve them, and the more they eat up and the better they purify. So at a certain level, well, they are actually eating most of the dissolved organic matter and taking particle organic matter into the sludge. So if we just separate the sludge well, in the final clarifier, we get a good purification for organic matter. So this can be used to design a plant uh, because we can choose an FM ratio that we know traditionally will give us a pretty good removal of organic matter. Uh, and I'm going to show you an example of by, by choosing an FM ratio, how can we calculate a, a needed mass of sludge and also uh, calculate the, the sludge age. So here's an example. We're looking at a situation with a plant with a 750 kilogram BOD per day in the inlet. That is roughly equal to 12,000 population equivalent. We say so 12,500 uh, people um, because a typical amount of BOD discharged for one person per day is 60 gram. So anyway, we have 750 kilogram of organic matter coming in per day. We also have other substances. So I've just specified here some, some typical numbers um, that, that correspond to, to 12,500 people from a typical uh, urban area in, in Denmark. Now, let's say we want to remove the organic matter primarily. Let's go for a 95% removal. With these numbers up here, that correspond to something like 300 milligram of BUD per liter in the inlet. And uh, with 95% removal, we'll go down to 15 milligram per liter in the outlet, which is a pretty uh, good removal. So how much biomass do we need? How big a reactor do we need to take this process uh, this far? Here we choose the FM ratio based on the diagram that I showed you before, because if we go by an FM ratio of 0.25, well, we have a pretty good idea that we will get a fair uh, removal of the organic matter in the process. Now, the mass of sludge we need is simply the amount of organic matter arriving per day divided with our FM ratio. And hence, we can see we need 3000 kilogram of bio biomass uh, in the process. So suspended solids, B, biological suspended solids uh, in our process tank. How big is the tank then going to be? Well, that depends on what concentration we have 
of the biosolids in the process tank. Typically, we can have some three, four, maybe up to five kilo per cubic meter. And if we choose four kilogram per cubic meter, then we simply just divide our mass of sludge with the concentration and we arrive at a volume of 750 cubic meter. And what you can see here is that is equivalent to one cubic meter per kilogram of BOD per day uh, for the removal of organic matter. Now, um, the choice of sludge concentration, of course, uh, now determined this, but I can't just choose this freely. It's clear that the more sludge I have in the process tank, the larger a clarifier I need in order to separate this sludge out of the water afterwards. So choosing a high number for my process tank will require me to have a big clarifier. If I choose a lower number, my process tank needs to be bigger, but I can save some volume in the clarifier. So there's a, a thing here that you need to, to look into uh, in the combined uh, total volume of, of tanks in the system. Uh, when you are looking for the most optimal uh, design concentration of sludge. But this is quite typical. Just to take the same example a little bit further, well, uh, if we look for sludge production, well, we have some heuristics. This is uh, from, from some of the literature for today, uh, where you can see that with FM ratios in around 0.25 or 0.3, well, we typically have a sludge production uh, of 1.1 kilogram of suspended solids or dry matter, pretty much the same when it comes to sludge per kilogram of BOD. So a yield constant of 1.1 is something that we by experience can say is pretty realistic for a plant like this. It's plus minus uh, maybe 10%, so not more precise than that. But it gives me an idea of the total sludge production every day simply by multiplying my yield constant by the total uh, organic daily load. And then I can see I'll produce about 825 or what you could say 800 to 850 uh, kilogram of sludge per day. This I need to remove from my plant and take away and store and dispose of uh, in order to keep my sludge and my biotank in balance. I can also calculate a so-called sludge age. And in this case, we can see that is 3.6 days. Uh, this is simply by taking the amount of sludge I've got and dividing it by the daily removed mass. So 3.6 days is the average time sludge stays in our process uh, tanks uh, under these conditions. So probably time for a short break. Uh, you can pause the video and return to it, uh, of course. Uh, I'm going to continue with the uh, example that I showed just uh, before, where we calculated the, the size of a process tank for removal of organic matter and also the sludge production and the sludge age. So what we had uh, in the plant uh, that we looked at is primarily, well, this part of the, the process tank, you can say, so, so um, there is, we are looking, looking here, uh, we didn't uh, include nitrogen removal, we didn't include a primary clarifier, uh, and we did not uh, either look at the clarifier, so obviously we would also have to look into dimensioning a suitable clarifier to separate the sludge from the water and return it to our process tank. And when we didn't have the primary uh, treatment, we didn't uh, have any biogas plant as well, but uh, we did, however, look at the sludge production and one of the key waste sources. Now, what I'd like to uh, go into now is to look a little bit uh, at the plant if we also include nitrogen removal. So what is the challenge here and how can we include this in our process design? Looking back at the, the key processes with nitrogen, we recall that, well, we had the removal of organic matter as an aerobic process. And when we have oxygen in the water, we also have, can have microbes if we, if we uh, make sure to have a condition for these special microbes that can take the ammonia and convert it into nitrate. So this is all very nice. And then we could include a step where the nitrate is removed by taking nitrate and organic matter and transferring it into uh, atmospheric nitrogen. 
Now, the dilemma or problem is that the ammonia and the organic matter is coming in the same mixture of wastewater. So if we start nitrifying our ammonia and this, we need to, as a first step, uh, we are introducing oxygen into the soup of, of sludge and water where the organic matter is, and hence we are removing all the easy degradable organic matter. And then when we get to denitrification, if we put a reactor afterwards, we have very little easy degradable organic matter and our denitrification hence is going to be a very slow process and we would need a very big reactor for the denitrification. So how can we overcome this catch-22 or dilemma in the nitrogen removal process? There are different ways to do this, but the most, you could say, common or maybe easiest to understand a way to try to use the organic matter of, of the wastewater in the denitrification process is the recirculation process or plant design. So in here, we, we simply start out with a denitrification tank. Um, so we get the organic matter from the raw wastewater into a denitrification zone, and then we put back a lot of nitrate from a subsequent aerobic process into this reactor to have some nitrate for the denitrification process. So basically you could say, well, uh, if we if we reduce, if we recirculate, uh, let's say four times the amount of the inlet flow, well, then we are re recirculating four out of five formed kilograms of nitrate into a compartment where they could be uh, potentially removed into atmospheric nitrate. So with this ratio here, that allows us for a removal rate of 80% of the dissolved um, nitrate in the water. And since we also have some nitrogen removal with the excess sludge, we can get up to a quite fine uh, total purification degree with this type of system. You could argue, well, this is an aerobic compartment, and if we recirculate a lot of water into the anoxic compartment, we will also take back oxygen. And this is true, but in the aerobic compartment, we work with very low concentration of oxygen in the order of one to two milligram per liter. So this oxygen will only take up a very small amount of organic matter before it is removed by the microbes in here and leave us us with an anoxic uh, environment. So this actually works uh, quite fine. Now, the thing is, in order to have the microbes that are able to transfer ammonia into nitrate, they are growing very slowly. So we need a very long sludge age, an old sludge, and hence a big reactor to facilitate the nitrification process. Let's take a look at that. We have a diagram like this. It shows us the doubling rate of the microbes that are doing the nitrification as a function of temperature. And we can see that, for instance, at a temperature of 10 degrees, it takes them 11 or 12 days to double in numbers. And that means that if we don't make sure that the sludge stays for at least 11 to 12 days in the aerobic compartment in average, we will wash out our nitrifiers. But if we make them stay longer, we will be able to support the growth of these microbes. So nitrification requires a minimum sludge age and a curve like this allows us to find it. The design temperature here is 10 degrees because we often want to go for making uh, nitrification possible all year around. And that is because Ammonia is uh, toxic to fish in the aquatic environment, so we would like to remove the ammonia all year round. I've put up here some 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 uh, explanations. Uh, we can see the sludge age is the mass of sludge in the reactor divided by the daily sludge production. And if you recall our example before, we had a sludge age of 3.6 days. So you can see we need to double or maybe even triple the volume of the process tank to facilitate nitrification. 
we need to have a sludge age that is about three times as high. And that only occurs if we increase the volume of the aerobic reactor that we calculated to three, three times the size. So including nitrification really requires a lot of extra volume. Uh, and this is only for the nitrification. We also need to have uh, a volume for denitrification. Uh, and we won't uh, look into the design of that in this case, but, but this should give an idea of what it takes to remove nitrogen. Including this in the design is really boosting the size of the plant with a factor three or four in terms of process volumes. So it will cost uh, money um, to in include in the process design. Finally, we'll just uh, take a look at uh, what we produce, the sludge we produce. So we, we, we saw we had a calculation of our excess sludge production. Now this sludge uh, coming from a treatment plant is typically quite different from, from so-called uh, primary sludge. I mean, this is, uh, it can be, it's long-term aerated, so um, it's relatively stable. Uh, especially if we have nitrogen removal because the sludge age is, is, uh, is very long. Uh, we still need to deal with it in terms of getting the water away so that we can store and transport the sludge. Um, if we do not have too many uh, toxic components in the sludge, we can use it as a fertilizer and texture improver in agriculture. Uh, because we, it contains uh, organic matter and it contains nutrients, especially the phosphorus component is very important to return to agriculture. But of course, we need to look into stability. We need to look into toxic components. We need to look into the, the hygiene of the sludge. Um, so there are a number of issues that must be met before we can reuse the sludge. And if, if not, uh, we, we have a sludge that's fit for agricultural use, it needs to be taken to uh, a controlled dump site or uh, incineration. So this uh, concludes my, my lecture here on, on the key processes of uh, the wastewater treatment. Thank you.